Today, we begin a new series, an expositional series in the book of Nehemiah. How many of you have read Nehemiah before? Awesome. How many of you like Nehemiah, the book? Good. How many of you will like Nehemiah, the book? Yeah, there you go. Now, let's do a little Bible, right? Somebody said, as they saw my knife in my pocket here, they said I was armed today. I am. Got my knife, my key life knife, blessed by the Pope. Um, the books of the Bible, right? Let's do, let's do up to Nehemiah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and then you get into the poetic books of the Bible. So uh, Nehemiah is toward the end of the historical books of the Bible. And you're going to love this guy. Uh, notice the title that I've given on your outline of this series, Living Large, Nehemiah, Grace, Realism, and Faith. And one of the questions I want to ask at the very beginning is this, why live small? Why plan small? Why seek, uh, why set small goals? Why, why live small when it seems like what God constantly wants us to do is live large? And as we look at the guy's life, as we look at Nehemiah's life, we're going to see how God pulls this man into a life that is way, way bigger than himself, living large. And we're going to see grace, realism, and faith, and and. Um, you know, what, what God did with Nehemiah, he's still doing, Jesus did with the disciples. And he's still doing with us today. Remember the meta narrative of the Bible? Do you remember those steps that we talked about? We talked about creation. We talked about what happened after creation, fall. And then after the fall, we see that God puts a promise to bring redemption uh, and, and, and then we see the final is the consummation. That is the grand meta narrative of what God is doing in the world, right? Question is, as we study Nehemiah, where does Nehemiah fit into that? You're going to see in a powerful way, because this really is a great book. Uh, Nehemiah is a key character at a key time where God is moving, catch this word, where God is moving his redemptive plan inexorably forward. You like that word? Inexorably? I know. It's a little early for that. What, is, what does inexorably mean? It means we could probably come up with 75 different definitions of inexorably right here. Let me tell you what it means. It means relentlessly, irresistibly, inevitably. As we look at Nehemiah, we see God's plan just continues to get pushed ahead and he is a key character he's going to really surprise you know some guys really surprise us don't they you see this little guy and he does he accomplishes a lot of things and he surprises you do you hear about pastor holmes this is a true story i love this pastor holmes and pastors get bad names for being geeks um he must have lived in the church that he served because he was asleep. Now, I don't believe he was asleep in the office. I believe he was asleep uh, in his room in the church he served, and he heard someone moving around the church. So he did what every good pastor would do. He grabbed his gun. <laughs> and he walks out, and he sees this guy, and he says, I commanded him to stop twice, and he didn't. So for fear of my life, I did what I had to do. And that was shoot, <laughs> in Jesus' name. Baytown police say Holmes shot the man in the right shoulder. They identified him as 27-year-old Lee Marvin Blue Jr. While Blue was lying on the ground in his own blood, Pastor Holmes says, I led him through the sinner's prayer while he was on the floor. He repeated the sinner's prayer after me, and that was about it. I'm going to go visit him. Now, is that surprising that a pastor would do that in... This is what you call violence evangelism. <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. I think the guy came to Christ. Uh, but uh, people surprise you. Nehemiah, how many of you up to this point have seen Nehemiah as one of those 
really key heroic figures in the Bible. How many of you have seen him that way? Some of you have. Now, less saw him as a hero than have read the book. I think by the time we get, my goal is by the time we get done with this book, uh, you're going to see Nehemiah as a man far higher in your estimation than you ever imagined. He really is a role model for us, a biblical role model. And as you're going to see, he also carries forth what I call uh, some types of Christ. He prefigures Christ in some unique and interesting way. And so we're going to look at this book in depth. We're going to do an expositional study of the book of Nehemiah. Up to this point, we've done uh, three-week series. Uh, now we're going to go in depth. And by expositional, I mean we're going to go verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept as we go through this book and see what God says to us. We're going to explain the text of Nehemiah, getting the main points and the subpoints from this book. So it's not really a topical series per se. Nehemiah is going to set the agenda for us, okay? And, um, but there are a lot of topics in Nehemiah. One of the topics is God. <clears throat> surprise, surprise. Uh, what, you're going to see a robust, muscular, full-blown view of God, maybe a bigger view of God than you've seen in a long time in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we're going to see God and His grace in a powerful... This is a grace story, by the way. We'll talk about that. We're going to see about the people of God, too. That's one of the topics in this book. Uh, God in His greatness, but also the people of God. How many of you are connected to churches? Raise your hand. That's almost 100%. I knew I was going to get 100%. You're connected to the people of God, the covenant people of God. We're going to see Nehemiah's connection to the people of God in a powerful way. We're also going to see a topic in, in this book that's, that's amazing. It's called the means of grace. We're going to see Nehemiah as a worshiper, as a prayer. I think there's nine prayers in this book, including one really quick what they call arrow prayers. Have you ever been about ready to go into a meeting or appointment and you go, Lord, help me right now. I need you right now. Those are called arrow prayers, right? Nehemiah does that. We'll see that next week. Um, but, um, but, but he does all these, also these full-blown prayers. He's a real example of a man's man who knows how to pray. Uh, and we're going to see a big emphasis on the Word of God, the Scripture, all right? Then we're also going to look at realism, the way the world really is. Uh, remember last week I said that there are those t-shirts out there, life is good. How, how many of you, don't raise your hand on this one, uh, wear a t-shirt that, that says life sucks? <laughs> right? There's a lot of us, I mean... Is life always good? Hmm. It's not from, from the existential human perspective. It's not. And one of the things I love about Nehemiah is that he, he, doesn't, he doesn't candy coat the world. He takes it as it is, and a Christian can do that. We can take the real world for what it is, speak of it in all of its realism, catch this, without becoming cynical. Without becoming cynical, Nehemiah does that. We're going to see that in a powerful way. Faith is a, is a major emphasis in this book. We're going to see how one man lived out in faith in a broken world. Catch this, guys. God loves to use non-impressive men to accomplish his tasks. In fact, I was talking with a friend yesterday who said this, quoting a pastor he'd done an internship under. He said, human beings were not meant for fame. We were talking about a major figure, pastor who had fallen. And he shook his head and he said, the pastor who, emphasized, who, who developed me said, human beings were not meant for fame. I believe that, by the way. The longer I live, the longer I follow Jesus, the more guys I see fall, the more major leaders in Christian churches I hear people look at as gurus and hold them up on a pedestal, the more I realize human beings are not meant for fame. There's only one that was meant for fame, and that is the God of the universe. Uh, and so uh, we're going to see how faith, a very non-impressive, ordinary guys like you and me, you said, but I'm pretty impressive. You don't know my degrees. I know you are. 
You are. I love you. You're talented. You're good looking. You're handsome. The world is jealous of this group of men right here. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. But, it, but compared to God, we're kind of ordinary, right? Yeah. He loves to use people just like us in powerful ways. Then we're also going to look at leadership. That's a major theme in this book. I just got a book yesterday that I haven't read yet. It's called The Emotionally Healthy Leader by Peter Scazzaro. He's got a good first name, Peter uh, Scazzaro. I've read one of his other books, so I, I, I think that this is going to be a good book, but I love the title, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. How many of us have known emotionally very unhealthy leaders? We look at Nehemiah. We're going to see a guy who had who was emotionally healthy because he was spiritually healthy. And so he's going to take us all across the board. Okay, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Nehemiah. If you didn't bring your Bible, um, you might want to start bringing your Bible to Key Life Men because we're going to, we're going to um, be going through it. Uh, and there's how many chapters in Nehemiah? Anybody know offhand? Uh, 13? 14? I should know this, of course. Uh, but uh, there are several chapters, 13, 14, and um, let's start out. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 11. Here you go. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly, very corruptly against you. And have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven. From there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord! Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Chapter 1. We're going to take two weeks to get through that. And I have three points for you real quick before we do some table talk. The first thing I want you to note from God's word here in this text is that the book of Nehemiah, I want you to get this, the book of Nehemiah are the memoirs, memoirs, that's easy for you to say, memoirs of Nehemiah. What are memoirs? Memories? His journal? Life story. His life story. This is the life story of Nehemiah. Look at verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. He, his last name, his name is given. He's the son of somebody very important, and that's why the name is put in here. But the words of Nehemiah, these are his words, and Nehemiah is telling us uh, what happened. In the, We're going to see that later in the book of Nehemiah, there's some lists and stuff. There might have been a final editor of this book uh, that worked with him to put it together, but, but these are his words for the most part, his story, his eyewitness account. And as we hear Nehemiah's story, it, begs me, it makes me ask the question, what's your story? Um, what has God been doing in your life? What is God doing in your life? Because every one of us has a story that God is writing. And it's an important story. 
The question is, are we going to allow God to use us like he used Nehemiah in furthering the plan of redemption through us? That meta-narrative, creation, fall, promise, redemption, consummation. You are a part of furthering the plan of redemption just like Nehemiah was. And so as you think of Nehemiah's story, think of your own story. Now I want you to catch this, a historical thing here. I want you to note that Ezra and Nehemiah, those two books, go together. In the, in the, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and the Hebrew Bible is written a little bit differently than our Protestant Bibles. Um, they put Ezra and Nehemiah together. They always were one book, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so some of the stuff that we find in Nehemiah that he doesn't explain, it was explained in Ezra. So if you want, you can go back and read Ezra. Uh, time out, can we talk? Ezra is not as exciting a book as Nehemiah. If it were, I'd be teaching Ezra before I taught Nehemiah. I'm not going to do that. Nehemiah, Ezra was a scribe. He was a... Remember the scribes in Jesus' day? Ezra was the precursor of the scribes. He was a great theologian. And uh, his book is absolutely crucial. But these two books go together. And what we're going to see is we see Nehemiah, it, later in Nehemiah, we're going to see how Ezra and Nehemiah were a great team. Totally different personalities. But they were a great team in furthering the plan of God's redemption in the world. And uh, so Ezra was the priest, Nehemiah was the governor. Synergy is a word here. Look around the table, look around this room. Some of you guys sitting at tables are from the same churches, some of you from different churches. Do you need the other guys in the church? I mean, you, of course, when a pastor says that up front of you, you got to go, yes, of course. But deep down, we Americans think, I don't know if I really need anybody else. Deep down, we are often on an independent self-achievement project. We are really, as Americans, so independent that we, we're not really sure we need or want to work with other people, but anything good has to be done within a team, and that's the way God is. And so he pulls men of diverse backgrounds and talents and gifts all along the sp theological spectrum, all along the faith spectrum. Some of you are brand new to Christ. Some of you are kind of middle-aged in Christ. I don't mean age-wise, earthly. Some of you have been following Jesus since the time of the Apostle Paul. Right? We got guys all... Some of you are... Some, everything I say to some of you is brand new. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool. We need each other, don't we? Absolutely. We're going to see that Ezra and Nehemiah make a great team because they didn't try to usurp each other's roles or gifts. Um... Um, so, first of all, I want you to note the book of Nehemiah uh, are the memoirs of Nehemiah, and he teaches us uh, a lot of uh, cool things. Secondly, I want you to note Nehemiah is price, precisely identified historically. Don't glaze over on this with me. It's early. I know. I only got a few minutes left. Uh, that sounds like a very exciting, way. hey, what did you talk about in Bible study this morning? Well, we talked about how the book of Nehemiah is precisely identified historically. But it's important. Look, look at Nehemiah 1.1. Now it happened in the month of, what month is that? Chislev in the 20th, years, 20th year as I was in Susa, the capital. In Ezra 7, we, uh, Ezra tells us straight up that he is working, Ezra is working in the time of King Artaxerxes of Persia. That, that's when Ezra's ministry started. And how many of you heard of King Artaxerxes? Good. That's great. I had a friend growing up who had a dog who named, named, he named him Xerxes. I don't know, where did that come from? Xerx, come here. And I was named after this guy, Artaxerxes. Uh, well, we know from history, and you need to understand whether you like history or not, that the Bible is rooted in history, isn't it, gentlemen? It's rooted in history, and you need to know that Artaxerxes reigned from 464 to 423 B.C. Did you get that? 464 to 423 B.C. Those were the years, 423 years before who was born? Before Jesus. 
Artaxerxes was the king of Persia. And you need to understand that while the Greeks hated Persia, Alexander the Great wanted to destroy Persia, right? You've seen the movies. But the Jews thrived under the Persian Empire, even in exile, because they were very good to the Jews. Artaxerxes is the king. Now notice it says in Nehemiah 1.1, it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year. Okay, anybody know what Chislev is? Don't look at your footnotes. Anybody know what Chislev, if you do, something's wrong with you probably. Or you're Jewish, because Chislev is the month, November, December. So this is in the winter when this write is written. And it's in the 20th year. The 20th year of who? King Artaxerxes. Now, Nehemiah doesn't say it because Ezra said it. Remember, they're one book. So he says here, the book that he starts out, it happened. My story, my memoirs begin in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. And so we know historically this was 445 B.C. When did Nehemiah, when did he start writing? 445 B.C. When did Nehemiah start writing? 445 B.C. B.C., 445 years before Jesus was born. That's when this story takes place. 13 years after Ezra came to Jerusalem. So Ezra came first from Persia to Jerusalem, and he was there first. And then Nehemiah comes 13 years later, and we see that Nehemiah is in the capital of Susa. How many have been to Susa? I haven't been to Susa. So there were two capitals of the Persian Empire at this point in history. Susa was the winter palace. Ekbatana was the summer palace. Some of you guys have condos at the beach. Good for you. That's awesome. Uh, summer and winter palace. He's in the winter palace, and that's when this takes place. Why do I bring these details up? You're saying, I really don't know, and I wish you'd move on. <laughs> I bring them up. Listen, I didn't, I didn't bring them up. Who put them there? Is, is the scripture written by man, or is the scripture written by God? Scripture is written by God. I didn't put these historical details there. God put them there because he wanted you to know that the Bible is, is rooted in real life history. He wants you and I to know at the beginning of the 21st century, he wants all of his people to understand down through the ages that the Bible is not merely a collection of nice stories written by some doting old rabbis years ago. Hey, here's a great story. Let's get a spiritual application to it. No! No! This is real stuff that happened in real time. And so biblical scholars have rooted for, when did Nehemiah start his ministry? 445 B.C., guys. And the plan of redemption marches on. This is very real. And, 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 I, and I want you to note that Nehemiah is nonfiction. That means it's what? It's true. I read a story, a book not too long ago, Ghost Stories, the epic account of World War II's greatest rescue mission. Uh, on January 28, 1941, 121 hand-selected U.S. troops slipped behind enemy lines in the Philippines. Their mission marched 30 rugged miles to rescue 513 POWs languishing in a hellish camp, among them the last survivors of the infamous uh, Bataan Death March. How many of you have heard of this story? Cool. When I, somebody talked about this story, I hadn't heard about it. This is one of the, the lesser known stories of World War II. Of, of, and on the, on the front is these guys carrying M1 Garand rifles, you know, and that's about it. Did you notice the military guys back then just didn't wear, you look at a military guy today. He's geared up with about 110 pounds of stuff on his back. He's got knee pads. He's got everything. These guys have little thin blue or green shirts, and they're M1 Grand. Now, they had a little bit more equipment than that, but they went out, and they rest. This is a great story. I'm going to tell you the end. They got those suckers. Really happened. I like stories that really happen. I like truth. Because truth enables me to understand that God can do something great in my life and through my life. I mean, fiction's cool. Star Wars is cool. Didn't happen. Star Trek's all right. 
they're naming planets after the characters in those movies now. That's cool. I like all that stuff. It's just not true. This is true. This is true. And as you look at God's historical word and what he did, you'll say, as we study Nehemiah, if God could do that through Nehemiah, what could God do through me? Maybe God has a bigger vision for my life than I ever thought. Maybe I'm thinking too small. Just maybe. Um, so I want you to know, number one, the book of Nehemiah is a memoir of Nehemiah. Secondly, the book of Nehemiah is precisely identified historically. Thirdly, I want you to note that Nehemiah was a, a committed Jew living in Persian exile. And we see that... Uh, I love this story, and we're going to get into it a little bit more next week. Uh, but before you do table talk, I want you to catch that in that time, he's in the capital of Susa. Verse 2, it says, he says, Hanani, one of my brothers, probably it was one of his literal physical brothers. It could have been a relative. The Hebrew word there could be uh, translated by physical brother or a relative, but um, probably his brother, came with certain men from Judah. Now, we don't know if these guys lived in Jerusalem and came back. I, I, here, here's what I think. I think this was an official delegation from Judah, from Israel, from Jerusalem. I think these guys had seen how bad it was, and they knew Nehemiah. What was Nehemiah's job? It says in verse 11, he was a cupbearer. Now, that does not sound like a, a big job, right? Uh, we had some missionary friends stay with us and, uh, this past weekend. He's a very gifted linguist. It was a lot of fun. He's half Cuban, so I was making Cuban coffee all the time for him. He's going, this is as good as my mother. There I was, just brewing that stuff up. I love that. Getting those little demi-task things out there for him. to drink. That was great. It's good. Cup bearer. I was a coffee cup bearer. That's a high position in my view. <laughs> Back in this time... Back in this time, if you were the cupbearer to the king, that meant that you oversaw the wine that the king drank. And a lot of times they drank wine because, for some of you Baptists, this might be difficult to grasp, but they drank wine because um, the water was bad. And so they drank wine. But you got to sample the wine, be over the wine, watch the wine, drink the wine in front of the king before the king drank it in case it was poisoned. So the reality is, is that Nehemiah was a Jew living in exile, that's true, but he had incredible access to the king. And they probably had a personal relationship. I mean, somebody's drinking a glass before you do, and they might keel over at any given moment. I mean, you develop a relationship with somebody that's risking their life for you every day. Nehemiah had access to power. And that's why I think these, these brothers of his, these friends of his, came from Jerusalem. And they said, we got to talk to Nehemiah. He's got access. Because stuff is really, really bad. And they come and they tell, what do they, what do, they do? Uh, well, see, a lot of Jews under Cyrus, the king, had gone back. Uh, been able to go back and, and reestablish what took place in Jerusalem. In 586 B.C., I've given you a lot of dates today. You're not going to get to heaven by knowing these dates, only by knowing Jesus. But in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, and, and under Cyrus, 70 years later, they came back and re started rebuilding the temple. But Artaxerxes, the king, had been told that the Jews were trying to foment a rebellion. And so he stopped the rebuilding of the temple and the walls, and these guys come back in Nehemiah's time, and they say, It's horrible. It's horrible. Look, they're in great trouble, great shame. The wall is broken down. They're, the gates are destroyed by, by fire. Can you picture that? Can you picture that in your sanctified imagination? Your hometown. Where are you from? Picture your home. Say, I'm from Long Beach, California. It was on the news yesterday for something. I go, hey, yeah, it's great. I saw the cool Queen Mary on the news. That's where I had a high school graduation party it's great to see it but what if picture your hometown the buildings completely destroyed no defenses completely a pile of rubble 
Nehemiah thought things were going good in Jerusalem. Thought the wall, the rebuilding was taking place. It wasn't. It was absolutely destroyed. And the people are vulnerable. If you don't have a wall around your city in the ancient world, you're vulnerable to anybody who comes in. Nehemiah was not only a Jew living in Persian exile, he was passionately committed to the God of the universe and the people of God. He was a self-identified Jewish man committed to God and committed to God's people. Now catch this. He was committed to God because God was a God of grace. And he knew that the Jews had been selected by God, disciplined, yes, put in exile, yes, but they had been chosen. And if you don't like that word chosen, I'm sorry, it's in the Bible. The Jews had been chosen of God. Why? To be a light to the rest of the world. Were they chosen just so that everything could be good for themselves? No, they were chosen so they could be God's people and point everybody else to the God of grace. And he understood that high calling. Listen, gentlemen, your identity is only as good as the one who identifies you. And the reality is that Nehemiah knew that he was a special guy called by the greatest being in the universe. And you hear all the time pastors saying that you're supposed to become a fully devoted follower of Christ, right? You hear that? You will never become a fully devoted follower of Christ until you are a fully identified follower of Christ by grace. Until you understand that your identity is completely, 100% wrapped up in the fact that God loves you because of what Jesus did on the cross. Not because of how you fail or what you accomplish. <clears throat> when you understand that your identity is like Nehemiah's, I am chosen of God. Well, however you want to look at that. That God loves you deeply and identifies you as his son because of what Jesus did on the cross. Then you can become a fully devoted follower. But if you're trying to gin, oh, God, I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to be all you want me to be. It is grace that leads to obedience. It is identification that leads to devotedness. And that's what Nehemiah was. He was a, but he was also committed to God's people. And, um, and I want to end with this by saying that Nehemiah loved God's people. Can we talk? Time out. Footnote. Do you love God's people? Don't say anything. <laughs> the proper answer is probably, the honest answer is probably sometimes. I mean, there are some times that I actually love God's people. I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. I love the idea of the body of Christ. Don't you? That God has called out a people of God, different denomination, different franchises. It's individual people that give in the families that drive me crazy sometimes. Nehemiah understood that his identity was not only as a son of grace, but he was connected to this body. You know what the church of Jesus Christ needs more and more? Men who understand their identity in Christ and men who understand they're connected to the other people in the church. Whether they want to be or not, Nehemiah thought of the people of God. Your pastors need men who understand that is difficult and downright obstinate and frustrating the people in the church can be. They're still God's people. Jesus died for them. My wife often says, when I talk about somebody negative, she says, Jesus died for them too, you know. I forgot that. Thank you for reminding me. No, not thank you for reminding me. Because now I have to love them. Um, but he loves them more than I do. What, what, I wanna, what I want you to do is I want you to read Nehemiah. Get this rest of this chapter this week. And then I want you to remember your identity. Now, who you are, and then I want you to think about that. Nehemiah loved not only the fact that God loved him, but he loved God's covenant people. And if we live independent 
We'll never make the impact that we would make if we work together for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your infinite grace and how you bring that and how you brought that into our lives as your sons. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross to fulfill in all time and eternity the, the, the redemption that we needed, how they looked forward to salvation in the Old Testament, how we look back to the fact that it has come, and yet we look, we look forward to the time when you will come again. Until then, until the time of the great consummation, even today, Lord, we ask that you would allow us to live as sons and leaders and workers and providers and warriors to spread your great gospel that others could know what we have found, how good you are. We pray these things, and I ask that you be with my brothers in the strong name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen.